Welcome back. In this video, we will be taking you through the event identification and the risk assessment process. This process begins with this diagram that illustrates the continuous cycle for identifying potential events within processes, new, emerging, or even existing, and performing an assessment on these events to determine the impact on objectives. It begins by identifying operational sub-processes. And to achieve this step, one has to analyze the strategic objectives usually found in the IDP and then defining a process for the specific objective. The best approach is to break down these processes using the three level model, mega, major, and minor processes. And while breaking down this core sub process, you must consider the following aspects. Is the process appropriately defined and correctly placed within the organization? What is the process trying to achieve? And how does it contribute or link to the strategic objective? Now, this is a typical example of how we would perform a process breakdown. See the strategic objective on the top left, financial sustainability, followed by all the key processes involved, supply chain management, asset management, budget, and expenditure. Now, these processes are classified as mega processes. For this example, we have selected supply chain management and the objective of the specific key process is to ensure a transparent supply chain management process. As we mentioned earlier, this objective would, if achieved, contribute to the strategic objective of financial sustainability. Now, furthermore, to break down this key process to the second level, we would typically have demand management, acquisition management, logistics management, and disposal management as our major process. We then go further down the major processes to identify the minor sub-processes. And for this process, we have selected acquisition management, and we can see that there's a process for petty cash purchases, written quotations, and competitive bidding. There can be additional processes as you perform a proper analysis in your organization. Now that we have identified our key sub-processes, think of potential events or inherent risks that could impact the achievement of the objectives. Remember, inherent risk means a possible event or risk without any intervention or management action. When identifying these risks, we should strive to be precise in the wording to ensure that it's best described, being sure to clear the difference between the actual risk and other considerations. These considerations are typical root causes and impacts in terms of the categories such as operational, financial impact, or even reputational impact, so that we can therefore select and deploy the most appropriate risk responses. Now let us go back to our sub-process and identify potential events. For the petty cash process, the typical risks that we can identify are the following. Misappropriation or theft of petty cash funds, misuse of petty cash, and insufficient petty cash float. And the typical root causes or contributing factors for these risks are that for the first risk to materialize, it would be as a result of the opportunity for fraudulent conduct and negligence by officials in the handling of these petty cash funds. Secondly, the misuse of petty cash would possibly occur if funds are used for purchases that are not in the benefit of the organization. And lastly, poor record keeping and tracking of receipts and other documentation could lead in differences in the petty cash float. Now for our next process, the written quotation process. The typical example of the risk here would be not obtaining the minimum required quotations for the procurement due to a limited pool of qualified suppliers available or the requirements are too strict or specific, or even uncompetitive pricing making the services too expensive. And then for our last process, competitive bidding, 
typical example of risks here would be incorrect specifications, tampering of bid documents, and the incorrect awarding of tenders. And the non-root causes or contributing factors are unclear or incomplete requirements, poor handling or safekeeping of bid documents, bias, and inadequate due diligence in the decision-making process, respectively. Now, with this information, we can capture the first columns of our risk register. Step 3. The Risk Assessment For it to be effective and sustainable, the risk assessment process must be simple, practical and easy to understand. Now that we have identified our risk and root causes previously, we now perform the risk assessment and complete the second part of our risk register. This involves assessing the risk that we have identified in terms of the likelihood meaning the possibility that the given event will occur and the impact, also meaning the extent to which the risk event might affect our organization. And to do this, we must find out what our total risk severity is by taking the impact rating and multiplying it by the likelihood rating. Normally, rating scales will be based on a combination of the quantitative and quantitative scales, um, usually out of five, but you might find others that are out of 10. The organization must develop a common set of assessment criteria. This is a typical example of a likelihood scale, and one has to thoroughly understand the risk to determine the likelihood of occurrence. Then we also have here an example of a typical impact scale and you will need to ensure that the impact scale that you select is relevant and realistic to the risk. Then we move on to the next step which is to identify what our residual risk is. Remember residual risk is the remaining severity of the risk after management intervention. We must identify all the current controls in place for each risk and assess the adequacy and effectiveness of those controls. Remember in the previous video of the risk management model, we discussed the various types of controls and details which are shown here. Once we have identified our controls, we must then determine how effective the control is based on the scale. What this table tells us is that, for example, if a control is perceived to be operating good, that means that the control is operating at 80% and that there is a remaining risk exposure of 20%. Remember, no control can have a complete or 100% coverage over the risk. Now let us return to our risk register. For risk 1, the misappropriation or theft of petty cash. Without any controls in place, we can assume that the likelihood of this occurring is almost certain, as employees will definitely take advantage and steal the petty cash. Now, because petty cash is usually small amounts, one would expect the impact to be low or moderate. However, imagine in a year, the SEM unit constantly reporting the loss of these petty cash funds and always requesting to replenish the petty cash every week due to a shortage or due to theft. In the long term, it will have some damaging effect on the cash flow of the organization. And so the impact should it then at least be major, if not critical. Then that gives us an inherent risk rating of 20. But now we also know that there are some controls that are already in place, such as the secure safe, which is on-site, um, used to store the, the petty cash funds. But when we go deeper to assess the adequacy and effectiveness of this control, we conclude that it is not really enough, as though as any official can still open the safe and steal the money undetected. So we then say that the perceived control effectiveness is operating average on 60%, if not even poor, meaning that it's, it is working partially 
or to a certain extent. From this information, we now compute the residual risk based on the remaining risk of exposure and say that 20, which is our inherent risk, times by the remaining risk exposure, 40%, making the residual risk rating 8. Now, let us assess our next risk, which is risk 2, the misuse of petty cash. In terms of the likelihood, we can assume that it is likely to happen at least several times in a year and that the impact we can also assume that it is moderate as as it can have a negative impact on operations but not on a large scale now with the inherent risk sitting at 12 the current controls identified are that there is a petty cash policy in place which outlines the kind of purchases that can be made and the procedure for making these purchases in terms of petty cash and also it includes the appointment of a designated official responsible for petty cash these controls are perceived to be operating average because despite the policy be in place the official can still purchase items that are not listed in the policy because there is no review or oversight made on the purchases and that there's still some risk exposure at present. Taking that into consideration, the res residual risk now sits at 4.8. The last risk that we can focus on are risk 6 and risk 7. Risk 6 is about the tempering of bid documents and risk 7 is about the incorrect awarding of tenders. The likelihood of both these risks occurring, especially noting the experiences in the public sector space, is that it is almost certain to happen. The impact is also critical considering how negatively it can affect the organization, which then result in an inherent risk rating of 25 for both risks. A few controls that we have identified is that when the bids are open, the bid document seals are broken and that the document is stamped and in addition, the documents are also stored in a well secure area with limited access. For risk seven, we noted that the bid committees have been appointed and that we also identified regulations and laws that guide how the evaluation should be conducted. As we identify that these controls are working good and unsatisfactory respectively it leaves us with the residual risk of 5 for risk 6 and 15 for risk 7. The last step of the risk assessment is to then identify and select the risk response strategies. Firstly we must consider the risk appetite against our residual risk and depending on the approved risk appetite level statements we must pinpoint where the residual risk lies against the risk appetite in order to determine the next course of action. If the risk lies on low, the risk requires minimal additional control intervention. If on medium, the risk should be responded to as this implies that the controls are somewhat adequate but require room for improvement and high meaning that there should be a change in controls or more emphasis should be placed on the implementation because the current controls are inadequate and ineffective. Then this will ultimately inform the response strategy to be taken next, whether to accept, avoid, mitigate, or share the risk moving further. Now let's head back to our risk register once again. For risk 1, since we had our residual risk at 8, which is placed within the risk appetite level, and so remember that in this threshold, it means that the controls are somewhat adequate but more improvements should be included. The best strategy is not to accept and monitor the risks, but to mitigate and reduce the risk. The risk owners are ultimately responsible for assessed levels of risk and defining and implementing the risk responses. And so the risk owner, the CFO in this case, must then commit to an action. Let's say implement cameras, for example, to record every activity around the safe. 
This will certainly ensure that the risk is well controlled. However, the cost versus benefit analysis is still important in this regard. For risk two, the residual risk is well below the risk appetite and therefore the base course of action would be to just accept the risk as it is currently and to continue monitoring the current controls. For risk 7, the residual risk remains very high above the risk appetite and so considerable action must be taken. We see the risk owner proposing the rotation of bid committee members and the implementation of a procurement system to mitigate the risk to an acceptable level. Some risk registers include a time frame to allow for continuous monitoring of these actions. Now we have completed our risk register. We do hope that you are ready to perform it on other processes that are in your area. Thank you for watching this video. Until next time, goodbye.